Okay, let's go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Very good. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. <laughs> Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Holy Spirit to be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Very good. Now you want to sit with mommy first or you want to sit with me? Huh? Where will you be? Oh. I was in the water. She's trying to cross herself. Okay, very good. Amen. Very good. Okay, are you going to stay here with me? Yeah, okay. Uh, Papa's going to read, okay? Yeah, sitting. Yes. Yes. Okay, where will you be? You'll be sitting here with me? Okay, okay, so. Okay, well. We will do our gospel commentary the best way we can. <laughs> Today, we're going to read from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Now, it's a little long, so we will read parts of it and just summarize the rest of it. Okay? Peter approached Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? You remember the answer of Jesus? Okay. As many as seven times, Peter asks, do I, do I forgive him as many as seven times? Now, Jesus says, Jesus answers, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, why is that, why is that significant? Why is that significant? Because the, the number seven in the Hebrew language and culture, seven actually means many. Okay, many. That's why you would you would see the number seven cropping up all through scripture many times, right? Seven capital sins, seven uh, sacraments, right? Seven this, seven that. Uh, the number seven uh, is very significant in the uh, Jewish culture. Uh, and um, one of those significant meanings is that uh, it means many, abundant. Okay? So Peter asks, well, okay, how, if, if a brother sins against me, how many times should I forgive him? Seven times? Is that, you know, many? And our Lord said, no, 77 times. Sometimes other translations would have it seven times seven. Okay? Seven times seven. This translation says 77. Whatever formulation there is, it means the same thing. It means almost endlessly forgiving, right? Many, 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 many times. But you would note that many times does not mean endless. It doesn't mean also there's no point of uh, ending because there is an end to all of the forgiving Right? That you can do. In fact, there's an end even in God's justice and mercy. Because if a person, after having been given all the opportunities to repent for his sins, still does not, and still keeps sinning, well, in the end, the opportunity dries up and he goes to hell. Right? If he dies with mortal sin. So yes, you forgive your brothers and people who offend God many, 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 many times. But there's an end to it. And hell is the culmination of all of those opportunities of forgiveness that we did not avail of with sincerity. That's the other condition, right? Yes, we can forgive our brothers, forgive people who offend us many, 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 many times. But the precondition there is, there has to be sincerity in their request for forgiveness, in their asking, in their petition to be forgiven. There has to be a sincere effort. And the parable today that Jesus narrates to us is proof of that. 
he tells us a story of a servant, right? Here. This is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor, one of his servants, was brought before him who owed him a huge amount of debt. Now listen. Since he had no way of paying it back, the servant just had no way of paying back the debt. It must have been such a huge debt that no matter, even if he gave all his salary uh, back to the king, there was just no way he could pay it, uh, pay the generosity of the king who loaned him so much to use for himself and his family. There's no way he could pay it back. Now, for all you know, the king knew that, but, you know, he just kept giving because he was generous, right? But then the time came for the reckoning. See, there is always an ending. There's a reckoning. There's a settling of accounts later on. And here is this servant who could not pay his debt. So what did the king say? Okay, since he had no way of paying, his master ordered him to be sold. Because at that time, slaves could be sold, right? So at least to recover whatever investment the master had put into this servant. So, okay, let's just sell him and sell his, ma his children along with his wife and children or all the property that he has in order to pay the debt. Now, what did the servant do? He begged for forgiveness. And the king melted. The king melted. His heart melted again with more mercy and compassion for this servant and forgave him all his debt. Now look, what does the servant do? When he got out, just after having been forgiven, he gets out. He finds another servant who owed him also a much smaller debt. What does he do to that servant? He beats him up and asks him to pay back everything he owed. Now, that right there is an indication that the servant who was forgiven by the king was not sincere. In asking for that forgiveness. Right? He was not sincere. He didn't really mean to ask forgiveness. He wasn't really sorry. Not being able to pay the debt. How do we know that? Because somebody who's really sorry. Okay? For his sins. Really sorry. For having offended somebody. Will try his very best. To forgive others. And to try to make up for the wrong things that he has done. And to try to better his life. And to try to straighten up himself. Rather than <laughs> do what this servant did. Which is to beat up other people and, 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 and be, 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 uh, be bad towards another fellow servant. So that is where you can see the lack of sincerity. And because of that lack of sincerity, that that apology that he made was actually a lie, what does his master do? <laughs> he did not only, you know, uh, 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 get rid of the servant, he, he, he disposed, of him, disposed of him in a very terrible way. He had him tortured. Tortured. Not just put to jail, not just sold, tortured. Right? Until he paid back the whole debt. Now that is an image of hell right there. Okay? Of course, in hell there's no more redemption. Once you get there, there's no there's no way you really restore yourself, okay, and pay the debt. But rather, well, you're paying your debt. For, your, for, in, for the rest of eternity. Okay? For the rest of eternity already. Which is really unending. So lessons here that we have to understand. Okay? Uh, things that you, I want you to, to, uh, to pay attention to. The, the, the slaves here had no way to pay their debt. No way to pay their debt. Not only because the debt was huge. But also because... There is a very, very big gap in the status of the master or the king and the status of a servant. Okay? There's just a big, big gap there that even relationship-wise, there's no way that a lowly servant would have been able to 
make up his debt with the master. Okay? Now let's translate that kind of relationship and offense or grievance or whatever have you with our own human condition, with our own human reality. Okay? Just think about you and your parents. Okay? The truth of the matter is there's, there's, there's a big gap between who your parents are and who children are. Okay? Um, I don't know how I could be able to explain that to you well, but anyway, <laughs> parents are parents, children are children. There's just, you are not equal, you're not peers. So every time you disobey your parents, okay, you, you, you are hurting the relationship between you and your parents. And it's really difficult to make up for that. Difficult to make up for that hurt that you cause your parents. Now, could you imagine if it's not only once or twice or three times that you hurt your parents, but all the time and every day and, and in such big things? Well, don't wonder where this white hair came from. <laughs> Maybe every strand of hair here that turned from black to gray is an indication of how much you hurt your parents. <laughs> you know, you know that joke. You know how that joke went. Of course, I'm just kidding, right? But the joke is, uh, I, I think there was this mother who told who told his daughter. You know, uh, uh, every time you disobey me, my one hair goes white. See, so if if all of my hair ter turns white, that is. An indication of how disobedient you have been. And then the, the, the daughter looks at her grandma, who is all white, and said, Oh, so <laughs> you must have been so disobedient. Look at grandma. <laughs> They're all white. Anyway, but yeah, there may be truth to that or not. Or it may be a matter of genetics. But anyway, you have to realize there's no way you can satisfy your parents every time you you disappoint them or you or you uh, 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 disobey, right? Now look at our relationship now with God. With God, God is omniscient, awesome, all powerful, omnipotent, infinite. God is God. We don't even know, uh, you know, the extent of how and who God really is. Because of our minuscule intellects, we cannot really see everything about God. But God is great, right? In, in many mysterious ways that we experience every day, we experience the greatness of God. And how dare we offend Him? Who is the source of all graces, source of all our benefits, source of our whole life, source of everything we have and how can we offend God? How can we make up for all the offenses that we commit towards God? That is why you see, even one small venial sin is already one too many. An offense against God, against the goodness of God. You know, many years ago, I had a friend who was trying to explain the difference between God and men. Or mankind, right? And I could not forget the story of this guy. <laughs> he was trying to explain to a high school fellow how the how the gap between God and man. And I think I will repeat this story for us because it's appropriate for us. He he explained it this way. Imagine if you were God. Okay? If we, man, were God, how small would man be compared to God? And he said, the, the distance and the, and the gap would be like an ant and a man. The ant would be man and the man would be God. You see? That's such a big gap that, uh, that uh, you know, um, there's a big <clears throat> difference there. But you know what, you know what God did <clears throat> to show his love for us and his mercy for us? And, and to redeem us from our sins. Because we have no way of paying back. What he did was he became an ant. 
See, God took upon the nature of man, made, took into himself the nature of man so he can become man like us. And then because he's already man and God, he can, he can represent us and take up our sins and redeem us from that sinfulness and offer us back to God as a cleansed creation, as a creation redeemed from sin and therefore now worthy somehow of being united back to God and reconciled with God. That is the, that is the, the whole beauty of Jesus Christ taking up our human condition, our human flesh, except for sin. Okay? He took our human nature so that, because we as humans, human beings, we cannot have a way of paying back the, the, the offense we caused God because we are not at the same footing. See? Because God is God and we are, we are human beings. There's no way human beings who offended their God can pay back. It's like servant and master relationship. There's no way that the servant could satisfy the, the requirements of the master to be paid back. Okay? So what happened here is Jesus took our slavery, took the form of our slavery and our human nature. And then put on his shoulders all of our sins in the form of... Of the cross that he carried to his death on Calvary. That is a beautiful image of, of what Jesus did to us. Okay? Because we just had no way to pay back our sins. Pay back our debt for, uh, for our offenses towards God. And so Jesus Christ took it upon himself to do that for us. So how do we respond? How do we respond to, to God for his goodness, for all of that forgiveness of our sins, for taking up the debt which we couldn't pay? What do we do about that? How do we respond to God? Three things that I would recommend. First, gratitude. Gratitude. We should really, really be very grateful to God. Right? For giving us that kind of means of saving ourselves or God actually was the one saving us right so he gave us a way to redemption he opened up a way to redemption for us by sending his only son Jesus Christ to take up our sins and redeem us from them ransom us from the hands of the devil we have to be grateful for that gratitude is the immediate response second Second way to respond to this goodness of God is to have a genuine hatred for sin. To have a genuine hatred for sin. We should really abhor sin. We should really... It should be the yuckiest thing for us to even touch and get anywhere close to sinning. Right? Just recall, we were talking about some topics at breakfast and we were feeling eerie and yucky with, <laughs> with what we were talking about, right? Well, you know what? That was nothing yucky. I'm not going to reveal what we're talking about. But anyway, that was nothing eerie and yucky, really. But sin? Yes. We should really, really, really treat sin like a very, very dirty reality. We should stay as far away as we can from it. And that means all sin. Not only mortal sins. But venial sins. Because, because if you don't stay away. Uh, uh, from venial sins. Well things pile up. And they lead up to mortal sins later on. If we, if we do not learn to curb our habit. Of falling into venial sin. And then third. Response. Which we should put uh, 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 in place is penance 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 to make up for our own sins and for the sins of mankind which we of course cannot do by ourselves and 
We cannot help ourselves because we have no way of paying the debt. But Jesus Christ allows us to participate in his suffering and death. Okay? By way of us taking up voluntarily certain mortifications, certain acts of penance that we can do on our own. And we tie it up. We match it there to Jesus' cross. Okay? We, we, we are like the, the Simon of Cyrene, okay? To carry a little burden of the cross, okay? And help Jesus in the act of redemption. Because redemption continues by grace up to now in the souls of every human being. And we can have a part in that. We can have a part in that by offering our little penances and, 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 uh, and attaching it Okay? Somehow, somehow attaching that penance to the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, to the cross of Jesus. Okay? So what are the three things again? Number one, gratitude for, yes, gratitude, Eva, okay? For our Lord's, you know, act of redemption, okay? And mercy, you know, and all of that good stuff. Second is, How's that? Hatred for sin. And number three, penance. Okay? Penance to make up for our own sinfulness and the sinfulness of others. Okay? Penance. Okay, that wraps it up for us, folks. Have a good day, everybody. And Eva, are we going to say goodbye, Eva? Huh? Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Look at what. Ava is busy doing there. Hi, what are you doing there, Ava? What are you doing there? Eh? Look at that. Will you say goodbye to everybody? Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. That wraps it up for us, folks. Have a good day. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, there she goes.